welcome you we are very happy to welcome you all for a webinar on hematopoietic stem cell niche personalizing stem cell research and therapy by dr ullas muni so to say a few uh, words to introduce the, uh, the webinar speaker dr ullas muni joined the faculty of savita dental college and hospital as professor in the department of biochemistry center of molecular medicine and diagnostics chennai he received his phd in hematology from the university of nottingham uk he had his post doctoral training at memorial sloan kettering cancer center usa and broad institute of mit and harvard usa he, he got trained in ipsc generation and differentiation from the university of queensland and monash university australia he was a recipient of the british association of cancer research award Recently, Dr. Moni was selected by the prestigious American Society of Hematology (ASH) to participate as one of the 18 hematologists from low and middle-income countries in 2019 to 2020 ASH visitor training program held at Mayo Clinic, Rochester, U.S. He was also selected as a visiting scientist, Department of Hematology, Mayo Clinic, Rochester, U.S. His research interest is on the bone marrow niche and drug resistance. targeting of leukemic stem cells ipscs sepsis and clinical flow cytometry dr moni we welcome you to take the stage uh, good morning uh, thanks uh, madam for your kind introduction and thank i really thank the organizers uh, for inviting me for a talk on hemopoietic stem cell niche personalized seeing stem cell research and therapy um Good morning to everyone. Uh, to start with, <clears throat> actually, these are two of the uh, stalwarts in the area of hematology, Professor Donald Metcalf and Professor Moore. And it was my dream during my college days uh, uh, to work with such great minds. And by God's grace, I got an opportunity. to work with professor moore and he was uh, uh, my mentor for few years and uh, <clears throat> uh, he uh, professor moore when you when you when you talk about professor moore professor moore um, uh, is actually a legend who discovered a blockbuster uh, drug gcsf granulocyte colony stimulating factor <clears throat> uh, which actually revolutionized the whole um uh, you know uh, chemotherapeutic uh, uh, regimen for oncology patients and uh, um, without his contribution uh, in the medical field um, no one can think today no one can think about uh, a high dose chemotherapeutic regimen for um, uh, uh, hematology and oncology patients and through professor moore i got an opportunity to interact and to spend some time with professor don metcalf Uh, and actually don was uh, professor moose mentor as well so <clears throat> uh, uh, it was actually whatever i learned in the hematology area my foundation is uh, uh, because of their teaching and their blessings so uh, it uh, my humble uh, greetings to my mentors uh, overview of my talk today i know a lot of students might be uh, attending this uh, talk so i'll uh, talk about some of the some some introduction uh, to to this uh, niche and uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cell niche etc so the overview of my talk is actually why stem cells are so popular globally and why they are an exciting entity for uh, 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 to study then what exactly is a stem cell um, what about what is hem hematopoiesis what is hematopoietic stem cell what is hematopoietic stem cell niche hematological malignancy and then coming to the modeling of niche in a, uh, and uh, the approach to a personalized medicine now the first thing is uh, yeah why uh, is news about stem cells so popular internationally and why are they such an exciting entity to study so at the end of the 20th century two major breakthroughs in the area of stem cell research uh, happened and more recently there is another trail blazing event as well so the first 
major breakthrough in the stem cell research is uh, actually uh, the first successful cloning of Dolly the sheep, the first mammal cloned uh, 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 by Professor Ian, Sir Ian Wilmot and his team at Rosslyn Institute, Edinburgh, Scotland. So that in 1996 was a big news, and that was a major breakthrough uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the area of stem cell research. And he achieved that uh, cloning by a technique called uh, SCNT, that is somatic cell nuclear transfer, where there is a uh, egg donor from a sheep and another uh, uh, nuclear cell donor from another sheep. So the egg was actually, by micropipetting technique, it was ennucleated and the, uh, the nuclear cell was actually uh, uh, the, taken from the udder or the mammary gland of the, of the sheep and then another one. And then after culturing uh, it for a, for a while, for, uh, for starving the cells in culture, uh, the ennucleated cell was uh, fused by uh, an electric stimulation and uh, by that stimulation the cell started growing and it, it, it gets it becomes an embryo and uh, transplanted or it was uh, into, into the uh, uh, surrogate sheep and that's how Dolly was uh, uh, formed or that, that Dolly was born. And the next major breakthrough, the second major breakthrough in the area of uh, stem cell research is uh, this one, that the development of an embryonic stem cell line from human uh, blastocyst. That is a human embryonic stem cell line derivation from uh, blastocyst. That is the inner cell mass of the blastocyst was taken and they derived uh, uh, an embryonic stem cell line by Jamie Thompson and co-workers at the University of Wisconsin, US. And this uh, 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 derivation of a human embryonic stem cell line opened up lots of avenues. The, the successful derivation of human embryonic stem cells from blastocyst provides potential cell sources for cell-based therapies for many human diseases. Like that, the, uh, the cloning uh, of uh, Dolly also has got a great potential in regenerative medicine, especially in the therapeutic cloning. Uh, uh, we can uh, even um, circumvent the issues associated with uh, embryonic stem cells as well. So these two major breakthroughs, followed by uh, the one that happened recently, which is the induced pluripotent stem cell. And this uh, is uh, uh, you know, induction of pluripotency uh, on a somatic cell and uh, this technique was developed by Shinya Yamanaka uh, and uh, uh, he did it and it published uh, in Cell uh, uh, in 2006. Uh, the first paper came out uh, from Yamanaka's group uh, on this IPSE was on mouse adult fibroblasts. By using certain uh, transcription factors, uh, especially four transcription factors, he reprogrammed the mouse uh, fibroblast cell into a pluripotent state. Uh, SOX2, OCT4, KLF4, and CMIC, he used those four transcription factors to reprogram the cell into a uh, pluripotent state. In the very next year, in 2007, uh, he came up with uh, the human fibroblast uh, induction of a human uh, pluripotent stem cells from uh, human fibroblast as well. So such path-breaking path finding uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, led uh, um, uh, Professor Shinya Yamanaka to receive a Nobel Prize within a span of short span of six years. In 2012, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine for the discovery that the mature cells can be reprogrammed to, uh, to become a pluripotent cell. So these three uh, 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 events actually led this area into uh, an exciting area or exciting entity for research. Now, these are the uh, things that happened in the area of stem cell research. So you might be wondering what exactly is a stem cell? So for some, some of the basics, so ba if, if, you, if somebody asks you what is exactly is a stem cell, they are I, defined as a cell that has got the capacity to self-renew and differentiate. A cell that can undergo self-renewing divisions and the cells that undergo lineage commitment and differentiation. And when you look at a hemopoietic stem cell, uh, you know, a cell that has got the potential to self-renew and differentiate. And also, if you want to confirm it as a hemopoietic stem cell, uh, we will talk about hemopoietic stem cell in the next slides. Uh, but uh, you need to, uh, 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 you know, show that those cells can repopulate robustly um, 
in an immunocompromised mice and by multiple transplantation techniques like a primary secondary and tertiary transplantation you can you can show that if you can, if you can show that the cells are uh, you know uh, you, you are you are capable of uh, uh, producing the same cell then that that means what you've got is a stem cell so in short a stem cell is a cell that has got the capacity to self renew and differentiate now Coming on to the, uh, I'm slowly coming to the hemopoiesis and hemopoietic stem cell. Hematopoiesis is the process by which the cellular constituents of blood are continually replenished throughout the lifetime of an organism. So throughout the lifetime, uh, uh, the, the, the different types of blood cells are being formed uh, uh, without any break. So there are, uh, you know, different, you know, hemopoiesis starts from right from the time point when we were in our mother's womb. So it actually starts uh, right from the embryonic state to when it to, till the uh, the development. So th there are a lot of different waves. So hemopoietic hemopoietic waves are there at different time points. So this is a cartoon. Actually, you can see that uh, the hemopoiesis is initially detected in the extra embryonic yolk sac right from around 2.5 to 4 weeks of gestation. And from there, uh, it uh, goes to another region. Uh, the wave starts in the, in the iotagonad mesonephros region from week four to 10 of gestation. And then uh, from week six uh, to 22, it takes up uh, uh, the, the hemopoiesis, uh, takes up uh, through different uh, 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 regions, especially the fetal liver, spleen, thymus, then placenta, uh, uh, the umbilical arteries, the vitellin vessels, et cetera, and finally to the bone marrow. So uh, postnatally, when you look at the bone marrow is the site of uh, hemopoiesis. So the hematopoietic stem cells, actually, they, they act, you can start seeing that thing right from week six to week 22, that time point when, uh, uh, when the hemopoietic waves moves from the AGM towards the fetal liver, spleen, uh, thymus, et cetera. <clears throat> so the hemopoietic system consists of various population of highly specialized cells that have unique features such as oxygen transport and immune uh, uh, defense, etc. And it is estimated that an, uh, uh, in an adult uh, human, uh, it generates roughly around four to five times 10 to the 11 hematopoietic cells per day. It's such a massive number of cells being generated in a day and it is a tightly regulated, it's a tightly regulated process. So the continuous production of many of these blood cells require a very highly uh, regulated uh, uh, mechanism, uh, uh, but and it is a, a highly responsive system as well. Um, then hematopoietic stem cells are found primarily in the bone marrow, as I told you, postnatally it is seen in the bone marrow, and that's and they are characterized by their ability to self renew and produce various progenitors and proliferate and differentiate into mature blood cells. And if you uh, want to identify or to characterize the hemopoietic stem cell, stem cells as uh, hemopoietic stem cells can be, uh, you know, uh, very basically you can identify uh, by the surface expression by normally by the expression of CD34 and CD38. So uh, a cell that has got an expression of CD34 and an absence of th CD38, uh, uh, they are basically uh, uh, hemopoietic uh, stem cells. So uh, when you look at the hierarchy uh, uh, of hematopoietic and progenitor cell lineage, this is a cartoon that you can see uh, that uh, it's a hematopoietic stem cell uh, uh, that lies in the top of the hierarchy from where all the other cells are being formed. And uh, you've got uh, uh, to one major pool of cells that is what you call as a long-term hemopoietic stem cell from which arises a short-term hemopoietic stem cell. And the long-term hemopoietic stem cell is responsible for the production of all blood cells in our body throughout our lifetime. And from that, you, 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 you produce the short-term hemopoietic stem cell. And from the short-term hemopoietic stem cell, you've got the common myeloid progenitors as well as the common lymphoid progenitors. And from common myeloid progenitors, you have got the megakaryocyte erythroid progenitors as well as uh, 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 granulocytic monocytic progenitors, from which uh, you will get all the platelets, uh, you know, erythrocytes, granulocytes, monocytes, etc. And from the common lymphoid progenitors arises all the different lymphoid uh, uh, cells, especially the T cells, the B cells, as well as the NK cells. So this is actually uh, possible by the because all these cells are being generated by 
this uh, hematopoietic stem cell and long-term hemopoietic stem cell uh, stay there throughout the lifetime to generate it in such a very regulated way. So this, the place where these cells reside has got a great importance. That's a, uh, the niche means it's a micro environment. So the, the, the micro environment where the hemopoietic stem cell uh, uh, lies is uh, what you call as hematopoietic stem cell niche. To, so to, 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 to ensure uh, the, uh, uh, the hemostasis throughout life, the balance between the differentiation and the self-renewal need to be tightly regulated. So the excessive differentiation or insufficient uh, uh, you know, self-renewal can deplete the hematopoietic stem cell pool, whereas an insufficient differentiation or an unrestricted uh, self-renewal can lead to myeloproliferative diseases uh, uh, and leukemia. <clears throat> So hematopoietic stem cell activity, as I told you, is regulated very tightly in that microenvironment or in that hematopoietic stem cell niche. So it is regulated by an, an intricate or a very complex interplay of uh, cell intrinsic factors as well as cell extrinsic factors. So the cell intrinsic factors are those factors, especially the transcriptional factors, the epigenetic factors, the metabolic uh, pathways associated with the cell. Those intrinsic factors play a major role in keeping this, you know, in, in maintaining this stem cell pool, in basically helping this, uh, the stem cell for self-renew and differentiate as well as the extrinsic cues. The extrinsic cues is actually uh, uh, the, the, the interaction between the, the surface of the cell, the surface antigens with the microenvironment, the cell signaling machinery associated with the receptor and uh, you know, ligand interactions and the signal transduction machinery associated with that. All these actually play a major role in the maintenance of this uh, pool in, 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 in the niche in, in where the cells reside. And, this particular uh, the environment is what you refer to as a stem cell niche. In here, in this case, it's a hematopoietic stem cell niche. So a stem cell niche refers to the local environment within the tissue in which the stem cells are maintained in an undifferentiated and self-renewable state and receive stimuli that determine the fate of the cell. So you need to have the hematopoietic stem cell uh, you know, lying in that region in a, in a predominantly in a quiescent state, especially in the gene art phase of the cell cycle and undergo appropriate self-renewal as well as differentiation. So stem cell niche play a major role in maintaining the whole, uh, you know, uh, the regulating the, the activity of this uh, pool uh, so that it will help uh, in the production of uh, uh, blood cells throughout the lifetime. So the whole, uh, my whole research work uh, actually based uh, uh, on this concept. The concept is, uh, you know, if there is some problems arise in the, in, from the bedside, in the clinical bedside, and that problem, can we solve that problem uh, in, the, in, in the bench side, especially in the lab, and can we translate that to the bedside? So it is basically a bedside to bench side and back to bedside is, 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 is what normally my research work is uh, all are focusing on. So something, and even my mentor used to say that if you are doing some research, it should have some translational value and it should benefit somebody rather than getting some few papers out. So the whole idea of uh, this particular talk I'm going to talk about is what exactly happened in, in the bedside and can I do something in the bedside and so that we can translate that back to the bedside. So I'm taking you to the real world situation. This is a situation, it's a, it's a clinical uh, case um, condition. A 35 year old gentleman coming to the hematology clinic. And uh, finally he was diagnosed with uh, a condition called acute myeloid leukemia. It's an M4 ca uh, class. I'm not going into the details of what it's M4. M4 is a myelomonocytic leukemia. Uh, it's, it's a different, uh, it's a classification by FAB. Um, uh, and uh, he was diagnosed with that. And also coupled with the, coupled with that, he had got a complex uh, uh, karyotype and he has got a complex karyotype and, uh, uh, um, and also uh, by uh, looking at the mutation, uh, uh, you know, this patient has got a flip three ITD. That means uh, it, he has got a tyrosine kinase mutation uh, that is FMS like tyrosine kinase and internal tandem duplication. And flip three mutation is, is, is considered to be uh, having a poor prognosis in those patients. And it is one of the major mutations you see in an acute myeloid leukemic patient. 
So, um, uh, to, 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 as an initial step, this, this gentleman undergone uh, remission induction chemotherapy. So after the remission induction chemotherapy, uh, again, uh, there was no remission achieved. And then ultimately this, uh, uh, you know, considering his age and all, there was multiple, uh, you know, again, another remission uh, regimen was given. And then finally, it, since it was not coming down, uh, he, was, uh, he underwent uh, a bone marrow transplant or a stem cell transplantation. And after transplantation, unfortunately, within a year, this gentleman had got a relapse. The disease came back. Now, there are questions, there are a few questions in front of us. Now, question number one is why did he relapse after the best possible treatment? So that, that the, the answer for that relapse is actually we do, we do know now that uh, there is a condition called MRD, that is a minimum residual or minimal residual disease uh, in acute myeloid leukemia. That is the residual disease that is actually there once when the chemotherapeutic regimen, uh, you know, the, the, the poisonous effect of the chemotherapeutic drugs is over the those cells which which are left that is left lurking in the bone marrow will cause the disease back they are predominantly the leukemic stem progenitor cell population that has got a resistance to uh, the chemotherapeutic drugs available so mrd is uh, is the reason why it's, it's minimum residual disease was there so that might be the reason why this gentleman got a relapse and Next question is, can we predict such a relapse that is happening to a patient? Yes, in, 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 the, in the current situation, you, we can predict the relapse of, uh, of, uh, of those uh, uh, patients, provided if you go for, do an immunophenotyping. By doing an immunophenotyping, we'll get to know that whether there is any residual disease is there or not. But the next question is, can we do something better? Can we do anything better in the future? for a targeted therapy or a personalized approach in such cases. So thinking in that direction uh, is actually the solution for that is can, if we can model that minimum residual disease in a dish, then there is a possibility that you know, we can think of a targeted therapy for that particular individual or for that particular condition. So that prompted uh, uh, you know, uh, me to, to start uh, doing uh, uh, work in that area, that is modeling of a minimum residual disease in acute myeloid leukemia. Or in other words, it is modeling of a hematopoietic stem cell niche. And uh, the work actually got, this uh, was over, and uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's still, there are some of the bits going on, but uh, um, this work ended up in some, of, some high profile publications in blood leukemias and all, journals like blood and leukemia. And uh, now I will, uh, uh, you know, it's what exactly is this personalized uh, medicine? So personalized medicine is based on the targeted therapeutic approach that allow for a patient specific care. Uh, that those old days are all gone. Then now in, in the next coming decades, what you are going to see is totally personalized medicine. Each individual is different. Patients are highly heterogeneous. So individualized or a personalized approach is the only way to, to cure such kind of, uh, or to treat such kind of patients. So the goal of personalized medicine is to maximize the therapeutic potential of health interventions while minimizing the risk for adverse effects. So, uh, you know, those who are uh, not into the, uh, in, in the area of acute myeloid leukemia, just a brief introduction before getting into the uh, re research findings. So acute myeloid leukemia is characterized by uncontrolled proliferation and accumulation of clonal myeloid cells without uh, significant differentiation or maturation. That means you will have a, a maturation arrest and you, you know, you see that patients will come up with uh, lots of blast population in their cells, in, in the blood. So one of the major mutations, as I told you, that's seen in those AML patients is split 3 itd It's a tyrosine kinase mutation, which has got a poor prognosis. So younger patients with AML have a complete remission rate, but the relapse occurs in approximately 50% of all overall cases. But that figure used to go up further, even up to 70% in those patients who has, who has who's got a split 3 itd positive as well. So many patients, uh, uh, will suffer a disease relapse due to the presence of this minimum residual disease following induction therapy, suggesting that the protection of those cells are there in the bone marrow microenvironment. And AML is thus, you know, it is thought to be thought to arise from a continuously replenishing rare and functionally distinct leukemic stem and progenitor population characterized by its capacity of self-renewal and generation of leukemic progenitors. 
And uh, if you look at the functional and phenotypic properties of a normal and a leukemic, uh, uh, you know, human uh, hematopoietic stem cell population, this cartoon is, uh, you know, shows how exactly, you know, or what exactly is the difference. So when you look at a normal hemopoietic stem cell, as I told you, you can identify a normal hemopoietic stem cell with the help of, uh, you know, ma mainly with the help of two surface markers, the CD34 and 38. Uh, exactly like that, so 34 and 38 is there in the leukemic stem cell compartment as well. But the striking difference between these two comes from the expression of an interleukin-3 alpha chain, that is a CD123 positivity on the surface of the cell. So, um, so you can identify that uh, AML uh, uh, leukemic, uh, acute myelard leukemic stem and progenitor cell with an expression of 34, 38, and 123. But CD33 is also there, but it is not there in all the patients. There, are, there is uh, some patients can uh, uh, patients uh, progenitor and stem population may express, but whereas in some other uh, patients won't express it. So, uh, uh, so to, to start uh, the, 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 that particular research uh, aspect and to model uh, 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 a niche, what we want to know was that what exactly is the microenvironment condition, even though it is a very, very complex, a microenvironment or a hemopoietic stem cell niche is a very complex, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, kind of a very complex uh, uh, situation, but we want to create that which is closest towards the uh, uh, hemopoietic stem cell niche. So um, as I told you, 34 positive, 38 negative, and 123 uh, positivity are uh, the expressions with which we can uh, identify a, a myelard leukemic stem and progenitor cells. Uh, before uh, we start our work, there was actually a, a, a very uh, interesting and a very fantastic finding that came up from, uh, uh, from Matsunaga's group in Japan, in Tokyo, where they, they published in Nature Medicine, and they found out that the acute myelard leukemic cells, they actually survive, they, as they, they produce an in vitro chemoresistance because of the, 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 the adhesion mediated resistance develops because of the, uh, the bone marrow protein fibronectin uh, with the help of a very late antigen VLA4 on the surface of the AML cells. So, uh, and there are also, there are studies on um, optimized uh, combinations of cytokines capable of supporting in vitro growth of AML cells. But there was, there was little or no work uh, uh, to emphasize on the cytokines that promotes the survival in the absence of growth. And that is a factor that may be important in the setting of a chemo, chemo uh, resistance uh, uh, and uh, minimum residual disease condition. So the rationale of the study was to optimize an in vitro chemosensitivity assay to model a minimum residual disease taking into account the leukemic stem and progenitor population as well as the, the, the microenvironment of, uh, of the bone marrow. So, um, so this was the experimental strategy that we followed uh, to, 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 to uh, go ahead uh, to model uh, that particular uh, uh, niche. So once when the patient comes, of course, we need to do the morphology as well as the immunophenotyping to diagnose uh, for sure they are acute myelard leukemic patients. So the bone marrow aspirates will be taken, the immunophenotyping will be done. So you will confirm that they are AML cases. And then the, the couple of uh, ML, say two to three ML of uh, blood, uh, or, you know, we, we used to get after ethical approval, we got those samples and uh, uh, we uh, isolated the mononuclear cells and that was cultured with and without the chemotherapeutic drugs in uh, the particular niche condition that we that we are going to develop with and without that niche condition and see how those uh, cells actually survive. So two analysis will go in parallel. One is actually to find out the viable cell content and the other one is actually the LSPC as a percentage of viable cells. So you will get from analysis one, you will get the total viable cell count. Okay, so you'll get the concentration of cells and in analysis two, you will get the leukemic stem and progenitor uh, uh, cell percentage. And from the percentage of LSPCs, and you know the total concentration of cell, you will get to know the exact concentration of the leukemic stem and progenitor cells. And this was the experimental protocol which we uh, uh, followed. And, uh, uh, for, and first and foremost is we need to find out exactly what is that niche that we can uh, create so that our leukemic stem and progenitor cells need to stay in, that, in an in vitro condition, need to be there, 
and it shouldn't differentiate and need to maintain that stemness. So people around the globe at that time point, when we started the work, we we're thinking on, you know, uh, proliferating the population and maintaining the population without growth. And what we are looking at is, is the survival. So that actually need to be created. So we found out uh, from our group, actually, um, uh, there are lots of uh, cytokines that actually favors uh, the, the uh, survival and uh, uh, differentiation of cells, uh, hematopoietic cells in the bone marrow. So we found out that the bone marrow, uh, the bone marrow protein, that's fibronectin, which has already been uh, shown by Matsunaga's group, that there is a cell-mediated adhesion and that helps in the survival. And coupled with that, we, 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 we found out uh, a set of cytokines which play a major role. So we want to know which of those factors actually is actually playing a role in the survival mechanism. So the cytokines uh, are, are the factors of the chemokines that we selected was interleukin-3, interleukin-6, stem cell factor, angiopoietin-1, thrombopoietin, uh, stromal-derived factor, then interleukin-1, as well as the insulin-like growth factor 1. So we uh, found out these, uh, uh, these uh, cytokines and these factors. And... Uh, 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 the concentration of those factors in the niche. And then we, we thought of uh, looking at varying combinations of uh, these particular uh, uh, cytokines and see which combination is actually preserving or maintaining this uh, stem cell, leukemic stem cell pool and without causing much of a differentiation. And, uh, uh, and this was the result what we got. And on, the, on that uh, a dot plot that you can see on the bottom left side, the top one is actually the, the, the condition before culturing. And on the bottom, the, the left side, uh, uh, that's a dot plot, actually the cells that are cultured in a serum condition. That is the cells grown on a serum uh, 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 culture media. And the second one is a, is a defined media where we know what exactly we are going, we are adding. So the best condition, what we optimized is that an immobilized fibronectin with interleukin-3, interleukin-6, stem cell factor, and angiopoietin-1 helps in maintaining the, 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 the leukemic stem cell, at least stem and progenitor cell population for 48 hours in our culture system without differentiating. And this, by saying this and show, so showing as a, in a one slide is a very simple thing, but actually for optimizing this thing, it took us uh, near about more than one and a half years to, to get this result out. And I'm really happy that, uh, you know, this was done in one part of the world and it has been multiple times, it has been repeated and it is reproduced uh, and it was cited uh, extensively from uh, Donna-Farber uh, Cancer Center in, uh, from Harvard Medical School more than eight, 10 times actually. So, and they also observed the same thing. So I'm really happy that this is working and so much reproducibly. And then what we did was that with that particular condition, we tried to compare the in vitro survival of both the leukemic stem progenitor cell as well as the bulk cells, that is the, uh, the, the, the whole population with and without that particular niche condition. So you can see from the graph that the comparison, uh, the A, that is comparison of the viable LSPC concentration from patients at the start of the experiment and following 48 hours in culture with and without the niche. So the niche is basically helping those uh, cells to maintain that pool. And, 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 in, this, and, and in, the, in the second uh, 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 graph, you can see that a similar comparison of bulk cells from uh, patients as well. So the niche basically supports uh, the, the, the survival of uh, uh, those cells. And then we move on to see whether this niche condition can uh, show uh, you know, what exactly happens when we treat that, uh, those uh, patient uh, cells with uh, uh, the commonly used uh, chemotherapeutic regimen for acute myeloid leukemia, it's ARC or citrabine. So we use citrabine and found out that this particular niche uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, LSPC treated with that uh, citrabine increased this significantly from a median 10 percentage of the control values in cells grown on a control well to around 36 percentage under this niche condition. So, uh, proving, uh, say, say, showing that there is resistance if you grow in a in a in a in a, in a microenvironment condition, in, in similar, almost similar to a bone marrow niche. So otherwise, you will see that the cells are all dying. So again, because we want, because the, we want to know that uh, uh, the the plit 3 ITD is one of the most uh, uh, you know uh, 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 
commonly uh, found mutation and it has got a poor prognosis. We want to know how the LSPC uh, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, show um, when it was targeted with uh, 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 FLIT3 inhibitors in clinic. So in the clinic, what uh, it was observed uh, at the time of our, before starting of our work was that there is a remission uh, seen in the peripheral blood, but there was no remission actually achieved in the marrow uh, condition. So uh, based on that, when we, when we looked at uh, uh, this particular, we, we, by using this particular niche, we, we started targeting uh, those cells with uh, a FLIT3 inhibitor. And by using a FLIT3 inhibitor, uh, this whole uh, uh, you know, table shot, what we found out was that as a single agent inhibitor treatment, uh, uh, that if you use it in that niche condition, instead of the cells being getting, instead of the cells getting killed, these cells are basically growing inside the niche condition. So the, the, that flow cytometry dot plots uh, on, on the right side, you can see that it, 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 on the B, the, the plot B the, with the niche support, you can see that those, those 34 positive, 38 negative, 123 population is basically surviving and it is being, you know, it is basically growing in that, that particular niche condition. So from this particular study, the initial study, what we concluded was that our defined niche microenvironment consisting of this serum-free uh, media with immobilized fibronectin and the cocktail of cytokines that support and maintains that LSPC population without the loss of phenotype for 48 hours. And uh, the defined niche condition that promotes the survival of LSPC from the samples and the ITDs, split three ITDs were completely resistant to inhibitor. And this actually was, which is what's seen in the clinic and this study also uh, does not provide a rationale for the clinical use of a single agent of flit three inhib inhibitors for to target uh, the residual LSPC after chemotherapy in a consolidation, consolidated he uh, chemo regimen. So this study also does not provide a rationale. And we clearly showed that this monotherapy is not going to work. So that's the potential that so and then uh, when then we, we, we found out when we started looking at why actually the split three ITD how that split three ITD is surviving. So we, in the lab, we first time, we, we reported for the first time that the leukemic stem progenitor cell population actually uh, uh, signals uh, through, uh, in, in the, those split three ITDs, signals through major three signaling machineries. Uh, that is actually through uh, PI3A KT pathway, and then uh, a JAK stat pathway, as well as for the, by, through the MAP, MAP kinase pathway. So these are the three which we found out uh, in that specific leukemic stem cell uh, subset compartment. And we thought that these are the three pathways that may be responsible for the survival. So with using that niche, and we, we, we thought of trying to hit those, uh, those uh, cells with uh, that particular uh, inhibitors, specific inhibitors for, uh, you know, uh, JAK-STAT, uh, PI3-AKT, as well as uh, MAP kinase. Uh, interestingly, what we found out was, was that there was a decrease in the viability of those cells uh, uh, for uh, 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 to a certain level and uh, individually. When we combine all those uh, inhibitors together, and still it, we found out that the, the leukemic stem and progenitor population, half of the cells only is getting killed, still half is surviving. And that means there are still lots, of, lots and lots of signaling machinery that is, a, is active in that particular uh, system. So we need to explore. So that work actually, it's another part of the work which we, we started doing for years now. And then we found out multiple signaling machineries actually favoring the survival of uh, uh, this particular leukemic stem and progenitor population. Then with this finding, uh, uh, we thought of uh, trying to see as a personalized uh, way uh, of uh, looking at a drug called gemtuzumab ozagomycin mylotar uh, that was specifically used for AML at that time. So the, the, the story is like this. So this gemtuzumab ozagomycin is a CD33 monoclonal antibody conjugated uh, uh, drug uh, and that is cytotoxic, uh, uh, you know, conjugated to a cytotoxic antibiotic calcimycin. So the, this uh, drug specifically targets to the CD33 uh, positive cells, uh, 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 that is positive cells uh, in, in, in the body. Uh, so once when it is internalized, this uh, calcimycin is able to intercalate with the, uh, the, 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 the grooves of DNA causing double strand breaks and that causes the cell death. That's the mechanism of this drug. 
But what happened was that even though the drug was there in the initial, uh, you know, AML trials and all in UK, but this drug uh, was used to treat AML cells uh, only between 2000 and 2010, because in 2010, this drug was withdrawn from the markets and in, 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 in 2010 mid. The reason being uh, there was no additional benefits over the conventional drug. So when we started our study, we thought why actually this drug is not getting effective because even though there are set on popular one set of population, where, uh, those uh, population of uh, leukemic stem and progenitor cells that has got a CD33 positivity. So in this study, we, we, we uh, assessed the leukemic stem and progenitor cell response to myelotarg and determined factors such as the CD3, 33 levels, the LSPC burden at the, at, at the, at the presentation, the FLIT3 status, the PGP status, PGP is the P-glycoprotein status, which is actually a drug or flex pump mechanism seen in these, uh, in these patients, and, uh, and check their chemosensitivity. So um, uh, uh, to, to bring the, the whole story short, uh, we looked at around 21 patients and uh, uh, we looked at the percentage LSPC, we looked at the CD123 mean fluorescence intensity of those expression markers, we looked at the CD33 expression markers, we looked at the, uh, the percentage cell kill by myelotarg on these patients, we looked at uh, the, the PGP status of those uh, uh, patients as well as the FLIT3 uh, uh, status of those patients. So the whole story short, what we found out was that this particular drug is not effective for everyone, but it is very, very personalized. And those patients uh, with a combined high CD33 positivity with a PGP negativity, coupled with uh, a FLIT3 ITD and uh, positivity and a low percentage of leukemic stem and progenitor population were most sensitive to this drug. Suggesting that these are the patients that can benefit significantly from this particular treatment. So by the time when we when our results come up, you know, in 2000, uh, uh, you know, after 2010, when we started these things, it came out and uh, the drug was off from the uh, shelves. But our finding was really something encouraging. So later on, a couple of uh, labs in the US was also trying to do the same stuff. Uh, in, you know, in this direction. So based on these uh, research findings from uh, couple of labs, coupled with the meta-analysis of the prior trials, and also the uh, results from the Alpha 701 clinical trial uh, uh, from the NIH, the drug was reintroduced in the US markets in 2018. Such a great uh, you know, uh, uh, relief and uh, satisfaction for, uh, for, you know, by seeing that you know, this will get benefited for one lot of patients. So that was the, uh, the, the, because of the development of the, you know, this particular work and the personalized way of approaching it. You can find out that who will get benefited and, uh, you know, what lot of, what patient cohort will get the maximum benefit. So again, by taking this inspiration, we move further and we thought of creating a three-dimensional niche, uh, 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 you know, more towards, uh, uh, you know, a uh, 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 real bone marrow microenvironment. And can we mimic that drug resistance in a, and can we, uh, can we maintain that, that phenotype, the cell phenotype for a longer period of time, say for example, for a week at least and check with various drugs so that eventually this can be used as a drug screening platform for those AML patients coming to the clinic. So this is actually a scanning electron microscopic image of a decellularized bone marrow microenvironment. And what we have done is that with the help of some of, the, some of our polymer chemist colleagues, uh, we, we developed a scaffold uh, with polyurethane with other biocompatible scaffolding material, especially uh, PLLA, polylactic acid, and has yielded a three-dimensional matrix that's having an improved mechanical property as well as the cell binding property. So uh, the, the whole story short, various combinations we tried, and what we found out uh, uh, from our uh, study was that uh, the, the combination of uh, PU-PLLA at a concentration in a ratio of 60 is to 40 uh, 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 scaffold by, we developed by using a, 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 uh, by using a phase separated using thermally induced phase separation technique in uh, tetrahydrofuran at uh, minus 80 degrees Celsius yielded, uh, uh, yielded a microenvironment like condition. And when we looked at uh, that particular situation, this is what a PUPLLA 60 uh, is to 40 uh, micro three-dimensional three uh, bone marrow microenvironment we developed. And we took a biopsy uh, from a patient. What, what we observed is that 
the decellularized bone marrow also almost similar to the in structure compared to what we observed. So by this TIPS technology, we developed this particular uh, bone marrow microenvironment, and then we started, uh, you know, uh, doing uh, with using this uh, platform. We 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 tried with the bone marrow uh, protein fibronectin, and also uh, with the uh, cocktail of cytokines which we developed uh, before, and tried to check the the the. Um, chemosensitivity of uh, uh, various uh, cells. We started with the KG1A cell lines, actually that is a leukemic stem, acute malar leukemic stem and progenitor cell line. Uh, and along with that, we tried in uh, various uh, uh, patient samples as well. And uh, the results was actually really promising. What we could find out was that we recreated a bone marrow niche-like environment, which has got the capability of culturing the leukemic cells for a longer period of time. And it could be useful to study the effect of various drugs in that platform. And it, it can be potentially used as a, as, as a drug screening platform. So, uh, uh, and this work actually, uh, all these things, uh, we, we, we uh, got it published in some uh, high profile uh, journals. And uh, uh, this is uh, actually the, 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 and by using this such kind of a platform, we can go more towards, uh, uh, to a, towards a personalized approach in targeting those leukemic stem cells uh, uh, in, a, in a better way. So uh, with that, um, uh, I, I conclude uh, my talk and uh, uh, I'd like to thank, uh, uh, you know, a whole lot of people uh, throughout the journey uh, who actually uh, you know, helped uh, in, 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 this, in, this, in this research. And uh, first, I'll, uh, you know, currently I'm, uh, I thank, I'd like to thank the Department of Biochemistry, Savita Dental College and Hospitals uh, for, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking me over here and uh, for accommodating me in, uh, in, some, in Savita Dental College. And uh, to my students, uh, Mays and Maya, who actually, uh, and all my students who actually contributed to these works and uh, to get these uh, works done. And to Dr. Krishna Kumar Menon and Dr. Neeraj, uh, uh, who is uh, who's heading the uh, transplant uh, uh, hematology uh, transplant in Ames, and uh, uh, and I was part of the hematology team uh, at that uh, where I was working, and also uh, this, uh, the Center for Molecular Medicine uh, at Ames Kochi. And also, I'd like to thank the funding or, uh, or agencies that funded these these, these projects. Uh, especially the British Association of Cancer Research UK, the Leukemia Research uh, Fund UK, and the BST India. And also, I'd like to uh, uh, you know thank all my alma mater. And after that, after even my graduation, uh, you know, uh, and my training, uh, I've got my collaborations with these places uh, from the University of Nottingham UK, uh, then Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center US, then Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Uh, uh, and also uh, from Queensland and Monash University, Australia. Um, and, uh, uh, and one more thing, if any students actually who's interested uh, 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 by this uh, particular exciting area, and there is an opportunity for those students who are listening, and there is a program also, we started uh, at Savida Dental College here uh, in the Department of Biochemistry. There is a program on uh, MSc in molecular medicine. Uh, it's a two-year program where you, know, you can think of uh, doing such uh, exciting works uh, 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 and uh, 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 you can have a bright future uh, in this direction. So with that, I conclude and I thanks once again uh, uh, the organizers and thanks for patient listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ulas. The panel is open for discussion now. So if any of the participants has any doubts, you can very well ask. I think everybody has got a good clarity of what uh, we discussed looks like. So, yes, ma'am. So, if there is no um, uh, clarification or if there is no doubt, I think uh, um, we can wind up. Okay. Um, thank you.
thank you so much for every attendees and panelists who were uh, there here in this online platform and i'm thanking uh, dr ullas moni for this uh, wonderful session and i'm thanking uh, dr vishnupriya ma'am for uh, organizing such a wonderful program and i think it is very useful to all the students who were attended here and i thank uh, our uh, director sir deepak nalaswami sir and uh, our uh, uh, dean of our savata dental college dr shija ma'am for uh, giving this opportunity to the biochemistry department and uh, for all other department also and i think kanad ma um, okay okay thank you very much sir can you please stop your uh, screen sharing sir thank you so much uh, dr ulas moni sir and please accept this uh, certificate for appreciation and thank you very much this virtual certificate sir thank you very much abraham oh thank you so much sir thank you so much for everyone